Let's go ahead and get started. So, Sanjay Prasad, welcome to the podcast. How are you, sir? Oh, thank you, Spencer. Thank you for uh, having me down here. Real, real pleasure. And having you down from, you said, Bethesda, Maryland, correct? Yeah, I live in Bethesda, Maryland, and uh, I flew in last night. Actually, I, uh, my daughter is uh, doing a pediatric residency at nice. UT Southwestern. She's doing her uh, second year. And it gave me a chance to have dinner with her and then come down and uh, have a, a great afternoon with you. Well, I'm, I'm happy to have facilitated a chance to see your daughter. I know, obviously, when kids grow up and you live in different locations, it's, you know, harder and harder sometimes. But to give you an excuse to do so, then I, I'm appreciative of that. If anything Absolutely. else, you got to do that. Absolutely. So, um, yeah. so how, she said she's in his or her second year of residency yeah. and in pediatrics. You were telling me a little bit off camera, though, she was focused, perhaps she had some mathematics background and she was looking at perhaps a more specialized uh, segment of pediatrics? Yeah, she she really got interested. Um, I don't want the whole segment to be about oh, her. Oh, but please, but, I love talking but, family. We'll, we'll hear she, the whole story. She was interested in uh, kids with uh, on the spectrum, and uh, and so she actually taught at a school, Ivy Mount, uh, near near where we live, um, and she was teaching math. She was helping the, uh, the teachers teach math uh, to these students, and she saw their progress, and I think uh, that's so exhilarating mm-hmm. to watch a kid progress with a skill that you've given them and I think uh, that just empowered her even more to go to medical school and be a pediatrician and uh, I don't know if she's going to continue developmental pediatrics but uh, but she certainly uh, got her interest in that way. That's, that's, that's amazing. I, you know, and those are the things you don't always think about, the sub-segments of sub-segments of populations that you can address that have different needs. And I imagine that was a very rewarding endeavor for her. So I know she's not your only child. So before we get into surge equality, um, and obviously what you're doing there, we'll, we'll talk about your book, uh, talk about your time as a physician. But I'd like to know some of your backstory, sure. your life story, family, of course, personal and professional. Why don't you give us uh, a little bit of an insight to who you are? Sure. Uh, you know, I was born in India. I was born in 1961, and I came to this country when I was a year old. Okay. And uh, it was a different time. Uh, we were a family of four, and, you know, I was, I was talking to my mom about six months ago, and uh, we were just having a, a conversation about why we came to this country. Mm-hmm. And mom said to me, well, you know, the only reason we came was because we had a healthcare situation, and we were looking for a surgeon. We couldn't find one in India. So, uh, and my dad had a, an opportunity to go to the, the Indian Embassy and work there. And we traveled by ship, if you can believe it, mm. for a 30-day journey. 30 days. 30 goodness. days, yeah. and arrived, you know, in New York and ultimately to Washington, D.C. We found a surgeon, took care of the surgical problem we needed to have done in the family. And we ended up staying. Uh, I got so enamored, uh, you know, I ultimately ended up in medical school and uh, empowered with that. And... That, that's how I started. Do you think that experience was the genesis for your interest in, in medicine? Was uh, the surgery uh, that you were talking about? Uh, I think or so. Part of it, at I, least. Yeah, I think so in some degree. But I, I can tell you, I was you know too young at that time. Okay. Uh, but I can tell you that seventh or eighth or ninth grade, you know, got an ear infection, um, and saw my local uh, ENT otolaryngologist, and he treated me and. Uh, you know, I was just enamored by uh, the volume of information that he had, the, the, different, uh, the different language, the whole medical <laughs> yeah, language yeah. is different. Yep. And, uh, and, and it, you know, such on a pedestal, he's just uh, a power of, of knowledge, knowing antibiotics, knowing how to treat patients, knowing how to operate on patients. I just got really interested in that in seventh or eighth grade. I told myself, I'm going to be in medical school. I'm going to go to ENT. And sure enough, that's what I did. I, it started really at seventh grade. It started very early for me. That's, that's incredible. And so, I mean, those, I know those are formative years, right? I think I, I've shared the story in the past where my father had uh, heart uh, issues when he was 37. I was 12 or 13 at the time. I remember that being that, oh, my goodness, there's a, there's a part of life where you have to pay attention to your health. You have to think about what you eat. Yeah. And I remember that impression of that one experience you know, changed, I think, the course of my trajectory and interest in health as well. So it's, it's interesting to hear. For some reason, it, it seems that 7th, 8th, ninth grade era team sin, or tends to be a kind of point of a lot of people's life where you have this discovery moment of things you're interested in. So you went down the path of, of medical school. So give me some of your um, kind of uh, journey through the, the, the practice um, and then you, you mentioned E N and E N and T, ear, nose, and throat. And what was the technical term for that? I could Okay, yeah. I, was, I read right. that, and I'm right. like, I'm not even going to try to pronounce that. Um, so was that interaction though? Is that where your interest in that specialty came from as well? It is. Um, you know what I what I will tell you is my parents really didn't want me to go to medical school. Oh really? Yeah. Uh, they my dad was an engineer. He wanted me to start an engineering firm with him. 
uh, you know, I wanted to do something different, obviously, and uh, ended up in that in that in that in that, in that sector. But uh, yeah, so uh, but I, I was really empowered and uh, very passionate about doing ENT at that time. Uh, I got very interested in uh, microsurgery of okay. the ear and the skull base um, very early on, and uh, really focused all my energies to get there. Uh, so I was I was very focused to begin with. Uh, and, and that's what really led to where I am today. Well, do you go into early stages of medical school with, uh, you know, a preconceived idea of where you want to specialize in? Or do some people enter into the medical field just going, I want to study medicine and then I'll figure out what I specialize in later? How does that process play I out? I was a rare bird. You I mean, are? I, okay. I, yeah, and I, and I knew exactly what I wanted to do very early on. Uh, I think 95% of students today don't know. They go to medical school because they want to help people mm -hmm. and and they want to do the right thing and, and leave something behind. Uh, they all have those, you know, those virtuous, uh, um, you know, endeavors in their mind. But, uh, you know, for me, I wanted to be a, a microsurgeon. I wanted to work with uh, the brain and the ear and uh, do some complicated surgery under a microscope. Uh, that's, what, that's what thrills me, so. That's incredible. And I, I, I'm, I'm curious about the actual learning curve and how that goes about when you specialize in not only surgery but microsurgery, how do you how do you practice? How do you prepare yourself to do that on a real life patient? What's that look like? Well, it, 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 you mean over the the of training course, episode? yeah. Throw the yeah. I'm curious, like how that actual the application of that surgery, how right. you learn the techniques. So it things. happens very slowly because it's a long, arduous process. Mm -hmm. The training is. I mean, four years of medical school, uh, you know, five years of residency, then two years of, of, of fellowship, training in neurotology and skull based surgery. Uh, so it happens over time. Uh, you know, you, you watch a lot, mm. you ask a lot of smart questions, you get a lot of answers, and uh, you read a lot, and uh, you practice, uh, you know, in a lab with uh, temporal bones that have been harvested, and uh, you do a lot of practice, and, uh, and you finally uh, you get to do parts of a procedure uh, during the course of your journey, okay. um, and then eventually you start to do the whole procedure, uh, and then the next thing you know, you're out in practice and you're on your own. Yeah. So, you know. And how long does it take to get to the point of being out of practice for somebody in your field? Or out into practice, excuse me. Well, for me, it was four years of medical school, five years of uh, otolaryngology training, mm -hmm. and then um, I did three fellowships in, in two years in neurotology, uh, advanced head and neck oncology surgery, um, and it's called base surgery, cranial base surgery. So uh, it, for me, it took seven years after medical school. So, seven years, okay. Yeah. That's, <laughs> I always, uh, I'm always um, fascinated as well as kind of awed by the commitment, right, of the educational process for, for physicians. I mean, it, it's, it's sometimes I know it's daunting, and obviously the hours are long, the years are long, knowing there's an, an end game in mind, but you're starting your career theoretically later than many people that just go into business or go into insurance might start their career. So do you have, do you have moments in time where there's doubt about if, if it's correct or were you always mission aligned and knowing that's what you well, wanted it, to it's do? It's so interesting that people... This podcast outside. is brought to you by True Captive Insurance, a premier medical stop loss captive for employer groups ranging from 25 to 1,000 employees. True Captive believes in healthcare that is personal and insurance that isn't complicated. That's why they take a white glove approach making it easy for employer groups to transition into a program built specifically for them. Check them out at truecaptive.com. This podcast is sponsored by PlanSight. PlanSight is a technology for employee benefits brokers to more efficiently manage their RFP process for any group size, all funding types, and over 20 benefit lines and point solutions. PlanSight is the only end-to-end -end RFP technology on the market today. Let's modernize your RFP process together. Check us out at plansite.com. It's, it's so interesting that people outside medicine think that it's such an arduous, long process, but when you're actually doing it, when you're actually training, it's exciting. Okay. Because you're, you're seeing new conditions, new patients, um, new situations, mm -hmm. new approaches, new technologies that are emerging. Uh, it's very exciting. Mm -hmm. And that excitement just carries you year after year. I mean, I felt that way, maybe most don't, but, uh, and it, it, the next thing you know, it's you're seven years later, and, <laughs> oh my God, you're a surgeon. Yeah. You know? 
Well, and that's, I think that's an interesting segue, right, as we get into the discussions of surge equality, um, your experience as a physician in our healthcare system, because obviously this podcast revolves around self-funding, revolves around the healthcare system, and a lot of what we talk about is either insurance-related or remedial and care-related as well. Um, um, but what is your kind of impression of having lived in um, the provider side of that equation? What was your experience like, good and bad? I want to kind of share some inside baseball. Sure. I'm, I've been practicing for 30 years, took care of tens of thousands of patients. Um, you know, I've seen anxious patients. I've seen depressed patients. I've seen knowledgeable patients. Uh, you know, I, patients are very inquisitive, come in with, uh, you know, a big stack from the Internet <laughs> and want you to read the articles uh, before they talk to you. So, you know, look, uh, it's evolved. There's no question. Uh, but I will say this. Patients today are being uh, steered by the healthcare system, uh, and they're being steered uh, for inappropriate reasons. Mm -hmm. So um, th they need help. They need help, especially when they're told they need surgery, mm -hmm. uh, because what's happening today um, is is horrible. It's really horrible. I mean, the third leading cause of death in this country, in the United States, is medical errors. Yeah, you, you mentioned that to me earlier, and I, I mean, that's astonishing to me that that's the third leading cause. I mean, we don't know exactly what the numbers are, but I mean, that speaks volumes to, right? And I don't think a lot of people actually consider that in the evaluation process for surgery is what is the likelihood that something could go wrong, the complication rate of that surgery. And yeah, you, you think you're going in for something routine and you really, you know, some people don't wake up. It's, 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 it's kind of a scary proposition to consider, and I don't know if it's given as much weight in that consideration process as it should. Yeah, certainly, and what we're, what we're all about is uh, empowering patients with smart information mm -hmm. so they make well-informed choices. That's what it's all about. Yeah. Um, well, and that's, that's what surgical quality, right? And I want to I yeah. touch on that in just a moment, but as this is obviously your perspective, I think, from the, within the provider side of the equation, but interacting with the insurance system, which is complicated. A lot of times there's a lot of paperwork, administrative burden. What was that early kind of um, experience like for you going, hey, I just want to practice medicine, but here's these insurance claims and all this paperwork I have to file. What was that like? Well, it was certainly eye-opening. I mean, <laughs> you don't it? learn about the, the business side of medicine sure. uh, in training. So, it, you know, we're starting from ground zero. We're trying to get a lot of d advice from people who have been through their process. Yeah, it was a, a learning experience, the whole insurance system, uh, you know, how you, how you navigate that system, how you, get, uh, how you fill out a claim, how you get paid for a claim, mm -hmm. how you account for a claim. Uh, you know, that's a whole different ballgame. I mean, we didn't learn any of that during training. Well, you, you mentioned that earlier, and I wanted to ask that question. Why do you think that is? Why is that part of the equation not addressed in medical school? Well, I think in, in medical school, most of our mentors uh, see us, especially when you become a fellow, that you'll, that you'll ultimately be an academician. Okay. Um, and all of that will be taken care of for you. And I think there's that, there's that thought process. But I was one of the rare birds, trained with you know, three fellowship trainings and um, did lots of extensive training and ended up in private practice, you mm -hmm. know, uh, which was uh, kind of unheard of at that time. Okay. So, yeah. Well, and then how, you know, how much time, if you were to give a rough ballpark of dealing with the administrative side of what you do versus the actual practice of medicine, do you know, have a rough estimate of how much time is dedicated to either or within your practice? Well, uh, I think early on we didn't have the manpower. Okay. Uh, so, it, you know, I would say probably, I don't know, 50, 60 percent was the business side of medicine. Okay. But, you know, obviously as we grew, we had other uh, you know, employees that would take mm -hmm. care of much of that process. So... Uh, you know, it just evolved over time. Well, and that's what, you know, I'm digging in a little bit on that because, uh, you know, obviously you see new uh, modalities coming up, ways to pay claims, barometers like reference-based pricing, using Medicare as a benchmark for payment, even potentially doing the way with networks and direct contracts and things like that. You know, it's, 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 interesting to me that we've spent so much time in this third-party payer model where some of these contracts and agreements or most of them are opaque. You don't really know until you go to the doctor and hand them your card. Even you may not know until months after the procedure what exactly my obligation is as a member. And so, you know, I didn't see the pre, um, you know, or the earlier side of this. I, I started an insurance when this was already the way mm -hmm. it was done. Yeah. And I'm going, how do we get here? You know, sure. one, how do we get here? And then what is the right solution or combination of solutions just to make the payment process simpler for the employer as well as for the member to know what their obligation is going in yeah. rather than finding out weeks or months later, right? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And so then when, when was the inception of 
um, surge of quality in this, you know, kind of in your career journey. What was your, if you will, your aha moment that this is something the marketplace needed and I want to address this head on? How did that happen? Well, it started in 2007. Uh, you know, I opened a, a surgery center, an ambulatory surgery center, uh, and I was basically moving some of my cases from the hospital setting to the ambulatory surgery center setting, really to save on costs for facilities, if that makes sense. Yes, yeah. So uh, it was a new concept back in 2007, um, and then we thought about it some more, and uh, we said, hey, why don't we bundle some of the services that we're providing, that is, the surgeon fee, facility fee, anesthesia fee, mm -hmm. why don't we just combine them and create a bundled rate? And so if we did that for the first few procedures, in 2007, 2008 was a special time you know, with, the, with, with the, the big bust that yeah. happened. Yeah. And uh, patients had high deductible health plans, patients were paying cash out of pocket, uh, and it was really viable because patients were happy uh, to have a lower rate, for, uh, a known course, rate yeah. right from the beginning for the entire service. So the whole episode of care was covered. Uh, and it, we thought some more about it. And gosh, this was all price-based, though. Mm -hmm. And where's the quality? Where, where's the yeah. quality? The quality piece is missing. Um, and in, it took us a few years. In 2014, I started Surgery Quality. Uh, really is an effort to add that quality piece mm -hmm. to the bundled rate piece. Does that make okay. sense? Uh, it makes 100% yeah. sense yeah. to me. Uh, and obviously, though, I've had um, kind of impressions uh, upon this line of, of discussion. So when you say introducing the quality metrics to the bundled uh, surgery, the, the payment uh, modality, mm -hmm. you know, what do some of those metrics look like? What are we tracking? How do, you, how do you also identify who is better or worse based on those metrics? Where, where, how are we tracking these things? So uh, what we've done is we've created a system where uh, surgeons, um, and you know, surgeons that I talk to want to participate in a platform like this, mm -hmm. but surgeons can actually use their outcomes data. That is, you know, they're high outcome surgeons, they're doing lots of cases, uh, put their outcomes data to the forefront of their marketing mm -hmm. to attract uh, surgical cases to them, mm -hmm. uh, rather than using bundled pricing alone. So uh, that's the whole idea, if that makes sense. Is that a prerequisite yeah. for the surgery quality, um, you know, participation is that they're also offering bundled surgery packages as well? Or could, okay. So yes, that, absolutely. Okay, yeah. that's, so that's interesting. So you're really combining a, a, the best of both worlds, right? We're yeah. looking to save cost, make it predictable, as well as actually ensure at least the highest probability outcome based on that track yeah. record of that physician. So how does that, how does that sort of differ then like, you know, the healthcare blue books of the world, right, that are sure. doing some of that tracking. How does your solution kind of differ in what they track and how you identify the best-in-class physicians and so things like we're, that? Spencer, we're very granular when it comes to the procedure. Uh, so we're looking at quality measures that are very specific to the procedure. For example, uh, if you're having gallbladder surgery, if you know how gallbladder surgery is done, it's done through some scopes in the abdomen, uh, you know, the surgeon carefully dissects all the tissues, uh, gets down to the bile duct, and uh, can inadvertently injure the common bile duct, which is a big problem. Uh, or they can get into so much hemorrhage that they actually have to open the entire abdomen to get control of the, of the bleeding. Okay. So we're looking at measures like bile duct injury rate. We're looking at something like conversion rate. So much hemorrhage, you have to open the abdomen. We're looking at metrics that really patients can understand because they're having the procedure, uh, and patients can start to think about and choose their surgeon accordingly. Does yeah. that make sense that to you? 100% yeah. makes sense. And so talk to me about from a member's perspective, right? What does it look like to interact with surgery quality? How does this get introduced into the fold where they know to even have this option available to them? Talk to me some of the logistics of that. Well, as you know, insurance is all pretty much employer-sponsored, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. you know, outside Medicare pretty much. And uh, so the idea is that we contract with employers who are self-insured for their health plan, uh, and the members uh, are educated at enrollment about the platform. Uh, we do have a personalized concierge service that handholds them uh, when they're told they need surgery. Okay. So whenever they're been told they need a colonoscopy or gallbladder surgery or intracranial aneurysm or ACL tear, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. um, all they have to do is sign a, a HIPAA release uh, with our concierge, and our concierge does all the back-end work. We okay. source the medical records. We source the imaging that shows the, the tear in their Achilles tendon or the gallstones mm -hmm. or whatever it might be. 
We send them up to the cloud, all HIPAA compliant, mm -hmm. safe and secure. And then we send the, the case, the surgical case, to all the surgeons in uh, their network mm -hmm. uh, related to that specialty and also under the area of interest. Mm -hmm. So the surgeons review, they get pinged about 10 new meningioma cases or, or 20 new hip replacement cases. Uh, they validate necessity, so important. Mm -hmm. They enter their past uh, experience, that is, doctor, how many have you done? What's your success rate? What's your complication rate? And we have very specific quality measures. Um, we validate that data through their electronic medical record through a proprietary AI-powered engine. Um, and then we score them against their peers, national registries, published norms, a lot of, a lot of stuff that's happening mm -hmm. behind the scenes. So Mrs. Jones gets back a list of surgeons who have seen her case, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. who validate that, in fact, she does need this procedure, or there are some other alternative treatment options that just make a ton more sense. Uh, but now she's able to pick and choose the surgeon within her network. Yeah. So we're creating a narrow network within that broad network. Does that make sense to you? And then so, does the member still have choice though in that equation, right? You might you say, hey, we vetted these and here are the top five or the top three for this procedure based on our analysis. Does the member still have ultimate choice as to where to go at that point? We're all about preserving patient choice, mm -hmm. yes. yes. And is there incentivization typically that accompanies that for the member to choose those options as but well? It depends on the plan design. In okay. some cases, you, there is a financial incentive you can lower the out-of-pocket cost uh, to use a certain option. Mm -hmm. But we're, we're doing something very, very different. I mean, there, there are a lot of companies that do that, right? We're using quality scoring, very granular for the procedure, to help the patients pivot to lower cost options. Okay. That just makes a ton of sense. Well, it does make a ton of sense. And so talk to me, um, you know, you mentioned a prerequisite, at least from the plan perspective, is to be self-funded. And I hope people are listening that understand yeah. that, right? The flexibility yeah. that is inherent to being self-funded allows you to introduce solutions like this Absolutely. to the fold. But talk to me maybe what, what are some use cases of when it maybe isn't applicable or some of the challenges in, in getting an employer to actually introduce this into the fold? Because I realize there's obviously the theoretical and then there's the, the pragmatic application. And sometimes not everything uh, co coexist. So how some of the challenges of this being brought into the fold or objections maybe sometimes that you hear, you know, walk me through a little bit of the sales process somewhat as well, if you don't mind. Yeah, so uh, employers, look, we can educate employers all we want, but the bottom line is it's, it's got to be broker driven. Okay. So we go to the brokers. We're, we're, our relationships are with uh, the benefit consultants that have uh, the right employers with the right plan design. Mm -hmm that allows this implementation, because that just makes a ton of sense to us. Is there a certain profile, so, though, of employer as you go through that broker channel that you identify is your sweet spot or tends to work best uh, for the solution? Uh, certain any, size segment or anything like any that? Any self-insured employer, it doesn't matter the industry, uh, but, but, but clearly someone, uh, an employer with a technology base, for example, younger patient population, probably doesn't have as many surgeries, mm -hmm. but uh, that's probably few and far between. But all other industries just makes a ton of sense. You well, know? and you mentioned, too, there's a screening process for necessity as well, which I think I don't want to skip over too much, right? You might, your solution could actually help them identify, well, this is an unnecessary surgery for this patient, potentially, right? So do you sometimes deflect even the need for surgery through surgery quality as well? Absolutely. You know, there's no need today. There's no need to buy a second opinion service. Okay. There really is no need. Okay. Because what we're doing is we're peer reviewing surgical cases to eliminate unnecessary surgeries. And as you, as you correctly stated, Spencer, 15 to 30% of surgeries across different specialties are unnecessary. Mm -hmm. and, and I can tell you that I was talking to an orthopedic surgeon in Texas uh, several, six months ago who told me 80% of spine surgery done today in Texas is unnecessary. Eighty percent. Eighty percent. I was astonished. Well, I'm astonished too. I mean, I don't, I don't necessarily doubt it. I'm not skeptical of that, but that seems like such a humongous percentage of those. I mean, what was the reasoning behind that, right? Is there other less invasive forms of, of treatment that should be done first? So we're just skipping over those and going right to surgery most often? We're skipping over surgeries, but in some cases, patients are having fusions they don't really need. Mm. You know, it's such a shame. Uh, and it's horrible. Yeah. And it's just absolutely horrible. And, and you know, peer review just makes a ton of sense to us. Well, it absolutely. makes sense to me, right? I think just you, you have, we talked about this offline a little bit, you know, you have this certain um, 
are of authority as a physician, right? Like people look up to their physicians with an element of trust. You obviously, because of your expertise in a field that is foreign to most people, you know, they trust you to your expertise and your guidance. And sometimes they don't even think to stop and ask a question because, well, this is what my doctor told me I needed. And so I'm going to go do it. But you, I think some people fail to reflect enough that go, if I open myself up, if somebody opens my body up, takes something out or fuses a, a piece of my spine, that's theoretically a permanent um, yeah. I- I- intervention, right? So taking a moment to go, one, is this necessary? Two, rather than focusing on where I was referred, but who is actually going to give me the highest potential for optimal outcome, things like that. Just a little bit more, I'd say, involvement in your own personal health care is something I've been trying to advocate for here recently. And I know you have we'll talk about your book in a moment. I know that was part of the genesis of the book as well. But I think this is such a crucial thing to consider, especially when there's that kind of unnecess- unnecessary so surgery being done, it's, it's astonishing. And, and, and look, I'm a surgeon. So, uh, you, you know, I know it from the provider <laughs> yeah, point yeah. of view, but I can tell you as a patient or a loved one of mine, you know, when you're told you need surgery, you really need to pause mm-hmm. and not run from the exam room directly into the scheduler's office and schedule the surgery. You really need to pause. You need to ask some difficult questions. You know, doctor, do I really need the surgery? Mm-hmm. Doctor, what would happen to me if I don't have surgery? Doctor, what are the alternative treatments that would, are possible? Doctor, how many have you done? Doctor, what's your success rate? What's your complication rate? What's happened to patients who've had complications? Mm-hmm. You need to ask these tough questions. And sometimes it's very hard for patients to know what questions to ask. Sure. Well, I think and, that's true. And I- that's what surgery quality is doing. We're asking the tough questions we're empowering patients with smart, intelligent information so, so they make well-informed choices. That's what it's all about. Well, I think we spend more time you know, selecting cars or TVs or you name it, you know, which pair of shoes is right for me to go running in versus the amount of time spent on consideration of surgery or alternatives as well. So it's, true. But it's also, I think it speaks to the convoluted nature nature of navigating the system as somebody that's not really experienced in doing so. Myself, even, I, I would probably have to ask questions of other people of how to do it appropriately in certain situations because it is complicated. It is complex. It is, you're also dealing with a person who, right. hey, my doctor said go here. I, I think he's right. Maybe I should go there. But when you talk about permanent things being done to your physical body and the potential for some really bad outcomes from that, just take pause, like you said, and, and consider yeah. what you're doing. Um, can, we, can we talk a little bit about your book, though? I think it's relevant. Sure, um, sure. If you don't mind, and I don't want to stop on the surgery quality conversation if that gets infused throughout, but you, you, you authored the book, Resetting Healthcare, with the subtitle, what, Post-COVID-19 Pandemic. Yeah. Um, it's the patient handbook. So, so talk to me about um, the idea behind this. Obviously, the disruption in your business I'd like to hear about as well for the pandemic. But tell me about the origins of, of deciding to write a book about this. Well, as we all know, the pandemic was horrible. I mean, we, we, we lost 900,000 lives in this country. It's, it, it, it was an absolute horror, right, for families in the United States mm-hmm. and my own in India, for mm-hmm. example. I lost a, a number of relatives. And, uh, you know, and what that pandemic did was it, it really caused us to rethink what's happening in healthcare, right? Uh, and the first thing it did is pause surgical procedures. Mm-hmm. Patients were afraid to go into um, a hospital and a, and a surgery center, or they were afraid to step outside their house. Well, right? there's a period of time where so they even prohibited in doing so. It was right? prohibited yeah. to do yeah. so. And it was during that pause, well, I, I had a pause myself, so. I decided I'd, I'd write a book about mm-hmm. surgery quality, and that's essentially what I did. But out of that pause, there's a lot of reflection. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, patients need to, to pause when they're told they need surgery. It's a great time to reset health care as we know it today. Mm-hmm. I mean, telehealth has just taken off mm-hmm. big time. We're at a point now where you can have a virtual visit with any kind of doctor anywhere in the country. It's amazing mm-hmm. what's happened. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is just the beginning. This is just the beginning because, uh, you know, now we can have technologies that can take all those complexities that you talked about and make them so, so much simpler and easy to understand. Well, do you, I think you, we talked about this uh, earlier, too. Um, there was somewhat of, a, I think, a general... Um, distrust maybe that developed in in people's minds towards the medical establishment, more medical administration, the bureaucracy sometimes that's involved in that, but somewhat of a mistrust of 
hey, I, should I be skeptical of the entire medical system now based on some of the things I saw that were confusing or the political infusion sometimes within the medical system I think was really unfortunate. But are you seeing that change the relationship you might have now with your patients? Um, or has that been a, a byproduct of, of the pandemic itself for you? Well, it's really interesting. That when you talk to patients, they love their doctor. Of course. They love their personal doctor. But they think all the other doctors around them, <laughs> they don't trust them. But yeah. they trust their own doctor. Yeah. So uh, there's this inherent trust. But it's not about trust and mistrust. It's about making the right decision for you based on the condition you have and, and your socioeconomic you know, uh, level too. Mm -hmm. So it just makes a ton of sense to us. Well, and I think from the my perspective too, just, it's really just causing people to take some accountability um, yeah. for not only the decisions, but is there accountability perhaps behaviorally, right? Or some of the lifestyle choices I make, you know, it, am I thinking about whether I should be doing some things in preventative in nature to sure. maybe prevent me from needing surgery at some point in my life? Could I lose weight? Could I make better food choices? Absolutely. Could I get more exercise? Go walk, get vitamin D, you know, all these things that are important for just general health. That was a, a reflection that happened to me. I've always been a healthy person. But early on when um, the gyms were closed down, well, my wife and I were like, well, let's just go run outside. You know, it's beautiful. It was, I think, in the springtime. Let's go get some sun. Let's run three or four or five days a week and, and get outside and go to a playground and do some exercises. It was kind of this rethinking of how I take care of myself sure. if the gym setting was taken away from sure. me. And so it's just like you said, yeah. everybody pivots. You reset a little bit. Yeah. But I think that kind of it reinforced to me how crucial it is for people to take accountability and ownership of their own health at the same time. Absolutely. So in some of the motivation, though, to, to get the book out there, to put these thoughts into words, you know, tell me some more of your vision of how we reset healthcare or what that resetting looks like long term in the future of healthcare. Well, I think telehealth is, of course, a major advance, mm -hmm. right? But I think digital technologies that um, allow patients and empower them with actionable data is really important. Um, and, and, you know, the Internet of Things and all the, the digital sensors that are being created and, uh, and people are accessing tremendous amounts of data. Um, you know, uh, they're identifying uh, patients with cardiac dysrhythmias earlier than they ever did. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's certainly a good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and modification of lifestyles, of course, it's going to continue. Uh, wellness is going to certainly be a major part of this. What is your perspective on the, the legacy style wellness versus today's more uh, kind of um, modern versions of wellness and lifestyle and behavioral health and things like that? Are you seeing things that are working in that space um, that are complementary to what you do? I, I, I think it's, it's going to be a slow evolution okay. uh, because, uh, and I know I've seen some graphs recently looking at per capita expense uh, in the United States compared to other countries on health care. And uh, it's probably, probably not a very fair comparison because we are vast, pretty unhealthy, mm -hmm. a pretty unhealthy population here in the United States compared to most other countries mm -hmm. uh, with obesity and smoking and what have you and just bad choices, right? And uh, so there's a lot to be done. There's certainly a lot to be done. Well, there's a lot to be done. And I wish, you know, I, I don't, we talked about whether or not there could be um, a public-private style solution? Is there a role for the government to play somewhat in the healthcare uh, crisis fixing? But the messaging to me seems to be non-existing around, you know, personal accountability and health as well. You know, why do we not talk about that enough, I think, in a public manner? Do you think there's a reason behind that? Or is that just people feel afraid to make recommendations about personal health? Why, why is that more, more of a public conversation you think in this country? Well, uh, to be quite frank, uh, Michelle Obama started this, right? She, she talked about the sugar industry and she was talking about, ob about obesity and life changes mm -hmm. and, and the sugar industry really got down on her. I mean, it was just, just uh, incredible. The lobbyists the power, came down yeah. on her <laughs> yeah. and the next thing you know, you didn't hear Michelle Obama talk about yeah, it anymore. such a shame. And you know, what she was doing was revolutionary, absolutely revolutionary. Uh, but th that's the kind of thought process we need to go through. Uh, well, I agree with you, right, is, is, is um, checks and balances for the power kind of of some of these corporations yeah. and influencing these outcomes or influencing, let's say, um, studies that are being done that they hope it comes to a perceived or a, you know, kind of a pre-concluded outcome that supports whatever they're selling. You know, I, I wish we could kind of dismantle or disconnect that uh, from our healthcare system and just talk about truly efficacy, things that work, um, 
for the member, right, for the person themselves. But can we can we pivot back a little bit to your integration with maybe the next gen folks and the the benefit advisor network? Ban, where did you discover that it would be good to develop this partnership with those aggregators of brokers? How did that come about? Well, we were obviously very interested in talking to brokers mm -hmm. because they're uh, they're essentially the army of uh, salespeople that we have getting to the employers. So it just made a ton of sense to go to the independent broker aggregators. Uh, and NextGen was one of them, uh, Band's another one of them. Uh, you know, there's a bunch of other institutional brokers that we're using as well. So it just makes a ton of sense. And they can actually pick, hand pick the employers where the plan design is such where it fits so nicely, mm. right? Where it bolts on so easily. So you have somebody sort of vetting the application uh, prior yep. to your involvement. That makes a lot of sense. Yep. And those, um, those the next gen folks, the band folks, I know there's a number of really good sort of aggregators yep. that you can be a part of. But you know, ePowered e e Benefits, uh, we were at their event in Arizona a couple weeks ago. Fantastic group of people having the right types of conversations. But you know, I realize that those that also is inherently an audience that's going to be receptive to ideas like this as well you know yeah. but what I know about those entities and others like them is they're thirsty for knowledge they're thirsty for innovation sure they really want to position themselves in the market as an alternative to your legacy style solution so it makes a ton of sense to, to connect with is it a kind of a formal endorsement is it informal is it just hey they know you're here and they bring you into the fold in the right situations what does that partnership look like well it is exactly that okay. so uh, it is that but I, I will say that um, although we may think of that group as being the most innovative mm -hmm. you know we also have talked to Blue Cross Blue Shield health plans and we, we talked to Cigna the other day mm -hmm. They're very excited about what we're bringing forth. I mean, they're all interested in enhancing the member uh, experience and, and getting the patients to the right surgeon at the right time. It just makes a ton of sense for them as well, especially their ASO product. So they're, they're looking in that realm as well. Well, that's certainly uh, yeah. good to hear. I think... Yeah. Um, you start looking at solutions like these, and I try to do my best at actually being unbiased, listening to them, finding where the things a, a challenge point might be to, to maybe make sure that they hold up against some scrutiny. But you look at something like this and you go, well, what, what is, again, what's the downside of this? Or why wouldn't this work? Why shouldn't everybody do, be doing this? I mean, it seems like one of those things that makes a ton of sense on the surface. But talk to me as you grow your business, you know, what are some of the challenges of getting this thing to, to scale or critical mass? Um, you know, some of the inherent um, maybe plan design issues or employer objections that you see that, that cause people to go, well, hold on, let's see if this is the right thing or not. Yeah, um, it's, it's convincing, um, it's also convincing leadership uh, that the insurance carriers don't necessarily vet their, the quality of their network. Okay. And I think that is, uh, and I had a conversation today on a webinar, uh, a little bit heated, uh, because the claim was, well, the insurance companies do this. And th the truth is this. I've been a participating provider for Blue Cross, Cigna, Aetna, United Healthcare for 30 years. When has any carrier ever come to me and said, Dr. Prasad, how many acoustic tumors did you do last year? Uh, how many uh, had a facial paralysis? How many had a spinal fluid leak? How many ha suffered a stroke? How many people died? Not once. So uh, the, they may claim that they have quality data. I think they're lacking. They're looking to us for the solution. Okay. So uh, it, it's, really, it's, really, it's really interesting. And I, I'll say something very, very important because colonoscopy is a very common procedure done today. But how many times have you ever asked your gastroenterologist what their adenoma detection rate was? <laughs> if you don't know what that is, ADR, it's... It's well documented by the American College of Gastroenterology. It's a rate at which the gastroenterologist finds a tumor in all the colonoscopies they do. And uh, it's 15% or 25% depending upon your, whether you're male or female. If it's anything below that, your colonoscopist is looking very quickly, doing 12 cases in a morning and missing tumors. Mm. And a missed tumor can lead to a liver metastasis, can lead to you know partial hepatectomy, partial liver resection, immunotherapy. I mean, there's an immunocompromised state, uh, and hit stop loss claims. Mm -hmm. So we're using quality scoring to help mitigate stop loss risk. Mm -hmm. 
with catastrophic claims. Does that make sense to you? Well, and I, I mentioned this, I think, uh, a couple weeks ago that I view stop losses sometimes as a validator, an objective third party to validate these types of solutions because if the data is there, the claims reduction support it or the avoidance support it, and they're able to go, well, we'll give you 7% off your aggregate factors, yep. or we'll reduce your stop loss premium by 3% if surge quality is part of the equation. That's that rubber stamp to say this works because somebody has looked at it from a third party perspective to say, does this reduce severity or frequency of claims? And are we willing to put numbers on the table that reflect that as we take that risk. And so that's where I, I see them as the validation institute of, of some of these uh, new point solutions or innovations. And I think you're, you're absolutely right. And I'm sure you have aggregated data that, that shows that as well, that helps yeah. really prove that ROI to the self-funded employer. And, the, and we have stop loss companies that offer stop loss credits. Of course, yeah. For, for using a platform like us. Well, I believe so it and it's it the right way a, to go, yeah. It makes a ton of sense yeah. all around. And, you know, uh, and people may say, well, you know, the surgeons are not going to like this. I can tell you there is not a surgeon that I have met, and maybe I'm hanging around the right crowd. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe so. But there's not, not a surgeon I've met that doesn't want to do this, that doesn't want to, you know, stop seeing revision cases. It's just a ton of sense. And I think there's another caveat that we often overlook is that this is an opportunity for surgeons to reduce their malpractice rate. Mm. Because these cases are peer-reviewed. Uh, this is surgery that absolutely must be done. We've got a team of surgeons that have said this surgery needs to be done. Mm -hmm. It reduces their risk. It makes a ton of sense. I can see premiums dropping because of a platform. Well, what is a link of time for that um, triage process to, to happen? Yeah, somebody you know, comes to surgery quality and says, you know what, I've got this procedure. I need it vetted. How long does it take that turnaround time for that um, analysis to be done from your end to get it back in their hands? Overnight. Overnight. Okay. It happens really quickly. We had a patient who had a seizure, who had a lesion in the brain in the MRI. They were headed for craniotomy surgery. They were headed for very expensive. Hmm. Uh, we sent this out over a holiday weekend. Overnight, we had four surgeons screaming back at us, stop, this is a virus. This is not a tumor. Repeat hmm. the MRI. Hmm. We did, and the lesion disappeared. So, I mean, what a tremendous savings for the patient, you know, let alone for the health plan. Yeah. Six figures, catastrophic, you know, uh, you know those terms better than I oh, do. Yeah, yeah. But um, these are the kinds of things that are possible when you can move medical records around in a HIPAA-compliant fashion, you know, at the speed of electrons. It just makes a ton of sense. At the speed of electrons, I like that. Well, I had a um, couple surgical experiences that were less than optimal, I'd say, as an, an ex-athlete myself. I played soccer in college, and I had a, a, a foot surgery for a bone spur that was, rather than arthroscopic, was an open surgery. And, you know, you talk about back then, I had no idea to ask, was this necessary? Is this the appropriate um, methodology in which to extract it? I just got uh, sent to a doctor that partnered with my school, and the outcome was okay, but I still have some residual effects from the scar and some tingling around the nerves and things like that. Had I known what I know now, I might have taken a different approach to, to surgically repairing that. And then another one, which hopefully I, I, my sense kicked in at that point, I had an additional spone, bone spur in the ankle that I went to get an MRI on. And that doctor, as soon as he saw it, also realized that it was a result of an ankle sprain. He's like, well, we'll get you in there. We'll take the bone spur out. And then we're also going to do a pig ligament on your, the outside of your ankle to strengthen your ankle. And I'm going, whoa, whoa, like I'm a 24-year-old guy. I'm not playing soccer anymore. I just wanted some pain relief. But here well, I was going to have my ankle overhauled by the surgeon right. if I had said yes to that. Right. that I, you know, I had enough sense to say, let's pause. But I think there's instances where plenty of people would have said, oh, okay. And then next thing you know, they're scheduling surgery. And you know, what their ankle looks like after that or other body parts, who knows, really? I, I had no idea what the, you know, surgeon's quality score would have been or even the cost would have been. Um, but having something like this in my hand would have been tremendously valued for either one of those uh, time periods. Sure. Makes so I, I love what you're doing, man. Um, so talk to me a little bit more broadly speaking, and we'll get wrapped up. The future in healthcare. I always like to ask this question of everybody that I'm sitting across. You know, broadly speaking, where do we go in the next five or 10 years? You talk some of the, you know, Internet of Things. Obviously, we're looking at quality metrics, bundled scoring, things like that, pausing of, of some of the choices, the decision-making process. But maybe globally speaking, what do you think the U.S. healthcare system undergoes in terms of changes in the next five or 10 years? Well, you know, the government wants to, uh, us to believe that single payer is the, is the answer. But, you know, really all the innovation has happened in the private sector, Spencer. Mm. Yeah, all of it. And uh, I'd say nearly all of it. Um, 
you, you know, CMS started bundled bundled payments, but it ended up in the private sector, and it's, <laughs> it's permeating like like nobody's business. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's hard to know. It's really hard to know. But what I will say is that I think digital technology is going to take us to places that we have not seen yet. We're going to be able to detect, it's just a matter of time with AI, we're going to be able to detect that patient that's headed for gallstones mm. and uh, modify their, their diet. And I think it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's all about the power of, uh, of accumulating all that massive data, mm -hmm. trillions of bits of data, mm -hmm. um, and using it in a useful way. But eventually we're going to get there. I could see an AI-powered engine that can predict uh, that you, because of your lifestyle, you are headed to having gallstones, or you pay, play a lot of soccer, mm. you're headed for an Achilles tendon rupture, mm. or uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I can see that happening. I'm not sure I can describe exactly how that's going to happen. What well, do you think wearables might play a role in that? You know, the, the, Absolutely. Okay. I think wearables will play a, a big role. I, I mean, you know, in helmets and football, mm -hmm. uh, looking concussion and pressure points. Uh, all that Internet of Things, all that accumulation of data. Uh, of course, it's going to be individualized for the patient because not all patients are built the same mm -hmm. way. Uh, and uh, it's going to be exciting. It's going to be very exciting. Well, I, I was talking to a doctor the other day who um, we were talking about the Whoop wearable, and then there was another one that he preferred a little bit better. There was a ring that you could wear, of course, the Apple Watch. But one of them, I think, had an EKG um, detection. Uh, EKG, obviously, with electrocardiogram, which right. measures heartbeat, right? Um, right? That might also be able to detect an irregularity yeah, right then and there on a patient yeah. and warn them. I think my father even uses you know, something that integrates with his iPhone for that yeah. effect. And that stuff is fascinating, right? If you could prevent a heart attack or give people, you know, early detection of warning signs that, hey, you are headed down this path if you don't have an intervention or a life And cycle. stroke is a big, uh, a big item, right? Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a big cost in terms of an episode of care. And if you can prevent that because the patient's having a little bit of dizziness, oh, we realize that he's got some irregular heart rhythm going on, you put him on some medication or do an ablation procedure to, to stop that ir irregular heartbeat, you prevent the stroke. It, these are the kinds of things that are going to be possible. It's just... It's mind-boggling. Well, it's mind-boggling, and what I hope doesn't happen, and I don't think will, is that we lose the actual human interaction and the doctor-patient relationship, that rapport that people build over time. You know, I like the idea of, like, DPC, or direct primary care, for instance, where fewer patients, perhaps, in, in that setting, the doctor doesn't have to continually run a lot of people through to hit certain metrics. They get to sit down for 30 minutes or an hour with a patient and hear their story, hear how they're doing. They're accessible more often, things like that. I hope, you know, Nice Healthcare is another one that does even on-site on, uh, visits at the home for certain things that we don't lose the human perspective in all of that as well because I think that's so crucial. And I don't think we will. Yeah. I, I, you know, our platform helps primary care providers with giving them the quality scoring. Perfect. They they can uh, steer the patient and advise them uh, as to which provider to use or not to have surgery or have an alternative form of treatment. You know, one of the things we didn't really talk about too much uh, today is uh, multi-specialty opinions because... That's the beauty of what you can do when you can move medical records mm. around in a HIPAA compliant fashion because we're connecting cases to areas of interest, not necessarily the type of specialty. Okay. So what I, what I mean by that is a patient with a colon tumor, for example, who's seen a colorectal surgeon who's about to have half their colon removed, you know, big expensive procedure, we also connect that case to gastroenterologists who do interventional gastroenterology. Okay. And now, because of new technologies, they can remove a cancerous polyp uh, through a colonoscope for a tenth of the cost uh, and be back to work the next day. Mm -hmm. So um, these are the kinds of things that become possible when when you can move medical records like, we, like we're able to do. Well, for somebody interested in, in uh, surgery quality or interested in getting connected with you, what is the best place, through LinkedIn, or would you like to direct them to a website or email or anything you like can, that? You can uh, get us through LinkedIn. You can, you can contact me. I'm at sprasad uh, at surgicality.com. It's easy. Um, I'm happy to send you a complimentary book if you want a book. I'm happy to send you a copy if you're so interested. Uh, you know... 
Yeah, and is there a way if, if, you know, they'll contact you or is there a place, the best place to find your book as well, Amazon, I presume? Or? Yeah, you can go on Amazon and you, I think Barnes & Noble websites are, have it uh, there. Perfect. Uh, yeah. Well, I really appreciate you joining me today. Any closing thoughts you'd like to leave the folks with that listened uh, all the way through the podcast today? I think, Spencer, you're, what, the service that you're doing right now in the, in the past years we talked before is phenomenal. Thank Absolutely you. phenomenal. Uh, you're bringing... Um, a level of expertise that's uh, very simplistic, understandable, and easy to understand format. Um, I, I just congratulate you well, on thank what you. you've built. It's just uh, absolutely amazing. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm still figuring it out as I go, but I appreciate your kind words, and it's been a pleasure to have you, Sanjay. Yeah, thank you. Talk to you soon. Thank you to our podcast sponsor, True Captive Insurance, a premier medical stop loss captive for groups of 25 to 1,000. True Captive believes in healthcare that is personal and insurance that isn't complicated. Check them out at truecaptive.com.